Hello everyone, good to see you on this channel of the ELAX, Institute of Education, Letters, Arts, Humanities and Social Science at the Federal University of Triangulo Mineiro in Uberaba, Minas Gerais, Brazil. Welcome to another seminar. If you want to receive a certificate of attendance, Please fill in the Google Forms link below. Today the seminar will be in English because the target audience is teachers, students, and research of English as a foreign language. The invited panelists are professors at the Federal University of Triangulo Mineiro, and the University of California, Santa Barbara. All of them were invited to show and discuss teaching remote classes in an emergency. And the guest discussant is Charles Bazeman, or Chuck, a renowned and recognized researcher and emeritus professor at the Graduate School of Education you see as B. Chuck will conduct the debate for the next two hours. Welcome, Chuck, and thank you very much. Good luck to you and to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Asir, and it's wonderful to be visiting with you and with uh, Triangulo Monero and uh, all of Latin America today. Um, this has been a difficult year for uh, all of us, and in many ways, um, many challenges we've had to meet. And, oh, there's one excuse. If you have to explain everything, anything this year, all you have to say is because 2020. So that is our uh, situation. And as teachers, we have been, have had, special challenges um, and and which has had to do with how do we teach remotely on, under these conditions and how do we keep especially how do we keep our students engaged and that's so that's a, a very big problem and I have been when I uh, when I start to have to teach remotely I went to uh, consult with my colleagues who uh, who in the writing program at UCSB, and uh, I learned a lot from them. And uh, so when I was asked to, uh, to speak to this, to this uh, seminar, I realized, no, my colleagues have a much, much more, uh, many more things to say than I do. So I, and then also there are some colleagues now from UFTM who will be also uh, joining the discussion today. I'm going to share the, my screen so you can uh, see the uh, uh, the program for today. There will be uh, five talks well, of 10 minutes, about 10 minutes each. Um, then we will try to run a discussion um, like a, in, in the, using your chat from the uh, YouTube on the YouTube channel. Uh, we will be able to read your chat, and uh, we'd like you to write in English if it is possible. If it's not, uh, we will uh, translate and we will uh, uh, make sure everybody understands. Uh, in the chat, you can put your questions about the talks and anything you want to post to the panelists, um, but also uh, you can share your experiences. And um, I hope we will have a second hour for discussion. And during that time, um, perhaps there'll be even more space to share what you've learned and uh, what challenges you have been facing. Um, okay, so our first presentation will be from Dan Frank in the uh, from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and then I will introduce each of them as they fo follow. Uh, Dan Frank will be 
talking to us about new spaces and new styles. Um, so now, Dan, you're on. I will close my screen and mute. All right. Hello, everyone. It is really great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Dan Frank. I uh, teach writing at UCSB. And uh, I have a little 10 minute presentation here. The main focus of this presentation is to give you some ideas, some new ways maybe to think about how you've been approaching your teaching. I think that uh, the situation of COVID uh, has put us all in a, in a whole new set of environments. And I want to argue that in these new environments, we're at an opportunity to rethink how we've been teaching. So I'm gonna share my screen if I can make this work here. Okay. Um, good, I think that's coming through. Okay, so um, what I want to uh, begin by doing is I'm gonna share a little drawing I did uh, for a journal actually about teaching. And I, I drew this to kind of represent how we're, how teachers are at the precipice of, of coming from a space that we used to understand. And now we're in a space that we're contemplating the great beyond, which is untethered from physical space and it's even untethered from time. And that puts us in a position to really rethink how we've been thinking about our teaching. So I wanna start with a question for all of you teachers. Uh, maybe this is a time to rethink how do we learn? Uh, and, and to start that assumption, we can start thinking, how do you learn when you're on your own, when you're not in a classroom? So I have some questions for you. When you sit down to read something, how do you do it? Do you read on a rigid schedule? Like every, every day at, at 2 to 3.15, do you read? Do you get evaluated for that? Do you dress up to read your book? Um, and what resources do you, you learn? Uh, what resources do you use to learn something when you're at home? Maybe you use a bunch of different resources, right? Maybe you move from resource to resource. You, you look at different tutorials. You ask questions on discussion forums. You try things out and you troubleshoot. And it works. But none of these actions are things that typically happen in a classroom. But we're not in a classroom anymore. So I want to present a concept called a skeomorph. And according to Wikipedia, skeomorph is a derivative object that retains ornamental design cues or attributes from structures that were inherent to the original. So a skeomorph is um, when you had an old version of a technology, it had certain uh, things like stitching in, in leather uh, seat covers, but then the new technology doesn't need that anymore but they pretend to have it. It's a fake stitching on that new leather because that's what we expected. We were used to the old technology and now uh, we, we are going through the, the movements of the old technology, even though we don't have to anymore. So examples include pottery embellished with imitation rivets, reminiscent of similar pots made of metal because that's how they used to be made, but they don't, they're not needed anymore. So my question for you, is what are choices you make, norms you follow, methods you use, genres you assign, ways of communicating, ways of evaluating, or expectations you have regarding teaching, learning, maybe scheduling, maybe how do you communicate, maybe classroom management that stem from the necessities of the old technologies, the necessities of being in an offline shared space in-person teaching paradigm. That is all to say, what in your teaching might be now skeomorphic. So I, I move here into offering that maybe a lot of frustrations that teachers are having are because they're trying to be skeomorphic. The modality of in-person instruction involves challenges like controlling attention, supervising work, um, necessitating quizzes and exams, and working on and controlling attention on specific schedules but none of that is particularly efficacious in an online environment. 
So the norms of that modality that are really hard to apply in online space. So we get all these problems like struggling to get students to get their cameras on, or we have problems with classroom management, or we keep running out of time because we're trying to fit everything in an old scheduling paradigm, or we're trying to enforce test taking norms, or we're struggling with students all over on different time zones. These are problems we never had before. So maybe we can start rethinking how we approach them. Marsha McLuhan writes that the medium is the message. And this is an amazing idea. He was really a prescient scholar. Uh, he kind of predicted the internet way before the internet ever came about. And this idea that the medium is the message is the idea that every technology carries with it its own discourse and methods and norms. So I argue that we're gonna be most effective if we embrace the modalities of the technologies we use and the ways that we use these technologies and will be least effective if we try to force the norms and shapes of one technology, an old in-person classroom paradigm onto another, which is our new online environment. So my advice to you is to try to rethink and re-embrace online discourse. When we learn at home, and when we learn online, we use multiple genres and we move across multiple sources. We focus our learning on projects and hands-on uh, experiences. We collaborate constantly. We engage with our peers through discussion posts and, and chatting. Uh, we experiment and troubleshoot and revise without grade penalties. We work, here's the, a really important one. When we work online, we work at our own schedule. We control attention at our own schedule, which means we walk away from the, the media when we want to take a break. Uh, and then when we come back, when we're ready, not at exactly 7.15 a.m. We communicate across different platforms at different speeds. And this is a graphic actually from the Connected Learning Alliance. And they've been all about rethinking how do you learn in uh, online environments? Uh, and, and these are the modalities with which we do. So the two things that I really focus on uh, in my online teaching right now is to maximize as much as possible asynchronicity, which is letting the communication and the learning experience happen on a flexible schedule but I also want to maximize interaction and use the various affordances of the internet to give as much of a sense of presence from myself and my students as possible. So to maximize asynchronicity, I let work be due at the end of the week. I have lectures that are made available and as accessible as possible with speech to text captions and PowerPoint that reinforces key points. And I make those very, uh, dis I, distribute, I distribute them and make them very accessible. I embrace form posts uh, and form responses of different genres. So I might ask students to write um, a form post in response to a reading, but I might also ask them to make a little video presentation or draw a graphic and make a graphic in response to it. Um, so they get to exercise different modalities constantly. I use one day to let them return in their work and then I put another day to let them respond to that work and get good peer feedback from each other. I focus on project-based learning rather than exams and quizzes. And to maximize the interaction, I try as much as possible to give a sense of presence. So I like a screencasting tool like Loom because it's very fast and it makes it very possible to just say, hey, record a quick Loom uh, that shows you talking about this assignment. I also like Loom because it allows for emoji reacts on, on the timeline and I'll show that in a second. I encourage commenting on everything. So every piece of media that I put out, my lectures, every documents that I share, I share through Dropbox and students can comment on those and ask questions. Um, I embrace uh, dashing off a quick reply. I encourage students to just constantly uh, react with emojis to each other and, and just say like, hey, I really love this. Uh, or, or annotate each other's work just with quick, instant replies to really build a sense of constant community and constant conversation happening, even though it's all asynchronous. 
Um, and I use tools like Slack, which lets me put them into work groups and I ask them to touch base with each other daily. And just a simple thing as if to say, uh, I'll give you five points per week um, if, you, if you just say something in Slack every day. Uh, that's enough to push them to start interacting. And they have a great time. They share things with each other. Uh, they communicate. They, they share jokes and memes. They ask questions. They answer each other's questions. And lately, I've been using a really neat tool called Descript, which is a video editor with an interactive transcript tool. The basic, uh, what this creates is a video that produces a transcript that I can edit that transcript. And when I edit the transcript, it actually edits the video making the video very, very fun. So just to quickly show you, here's what Loom looks like and a student can talk. And as the student shares their screen, their peers can be sharing these emojis and that gives a real sense of, of classroom uh, interaction. And um, here's my Slack. And as you can see, I, I do uh, work, group, um, work group spaces for the students to share and talk and as I said, I encourage just getting in there and, and interacting with each other. And this is what Descript looks like. And as you can see, it's, it's a transcript on this side. And say I could like write about my response to a paper. And as I annotate it, uh, the things I say appear over here and then I can edit it on this side. So that really gives a sense of my presence and, uh, and Accessibility is so important. So everything I say gets reinforced visually and, and textually. And then I give them all day to think about it and respond to it at their own time. So those are the main things I want to uh, share for now. Um, I believe we'll do a, a Q&A afterwards. So I'm really excited to, to delve a little bit deeper into the, the stuff I just showed here. But I'll go ahead, I'm gonna stop sharing. And yes, thank you for your attention. I'm gonna turn it back over to Chuck. Oh, thanks a lot, Dan. You, uh, you're really helping us rethink whatever technologies you have accessible to you. The, the important point is just to rethink what you're doing, what will work in this new space and what are the opportunities that the new spaces and new technologies uh, can give you. In fact, I see, think in some ways, one of my classes is working better if, uh, given the technology than it did in the face-to-face -face version. Uh, others, not so much, but uh, one it's figured out. Um, and now um, in, the, in the chat, if you have a question directed specifically towards one person, um, you can, um, indicate that as well as just general questions and we'll try to get to them all uh, to them all later on next we're going to be having uh an, again another kind of rethinking um from uh anna amelia anna amelia Calances de rosa from um from uftm and it's on uh, methodologies and evaluation what remote teaching has taught us so anna you're on and I will vanish. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good evening. It's really nice to be here with all these great names. Um, my name is Ana Amelia. I'm a full time professor at UFTM. And tonight I want to talk to you about some lessons, some examples, um, some things we have learned on this time of remote teaching things that remote times are forcing us to learn. Uh, so, just a minute, share my screen. Okay. All right, so. Okay, so I'm, I'm starting, uh, I named this presentation Methodologies and Evaluation, but I think my presentation is really, it, it has a lot to do with dance presentation, okay? 
Um, so uh, digital learning or digital objects are not something very brand new, right? Uh, most of us know that uh, since late 1990s, researchers have been discussing uh, new demands of education according to direct social and technological changes, right? Uh, this digital uh, madness has been here for some time now. Um, but of course, we know that the COVID, uh, COVID emergence forced us to start acting because we've been thinking, thinking and discussing and trying to apply some new stuff. But this emergence has uh, forced us to reinvent ourselves, right? There are some traditional practices that have not been uh, well received in long distance learning. Uh, we thought that we could teach the same course only using the internet, but turns out um, that's not working very well. So we can't have long lectures anymore. I can't teach four hour long lectures straight to my students, right? Uh, also students have been overwhelmed with excessive number of tasks because somehow we managed to think that if we're not face-to-face, uh, -face, then maybe we have to compensate in some ways. Um, also, uh, traditional testing is not working anymore. And of course, we've been experiencing some limited interaction. Uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna give some examples of that, but uh, here at WFTM, for example, we use a lot the app Google Meet. And in our version, we don't have the breakout rooms, for example. So it's something that can cause some trouble when we're trying to uh, turn our uh, classes into more dynamic activities. Um, so we have this problem. We want to solve uh, this um, challenge of teaching online. So uh, how could we rethink our classes so we can take the best of technology? And also, how can we try new strategies? And we have some hypotheses. I have a hypothesis. Since my doctorate, I've been studying a little bit about new literacies. And uh, we read a lot about this new ethos, right? So for working properly with digital objects and digital learning, we should uh, involve ourselves and try to figure out this new ethos. A variety of modes and media in meaning making, uh, a post-industry industry thinking, hybrid cultural contests, and also learners as creators and curators. Um, so we can say that in, in for this hypothesis, digital technologies of information and communication has have transformed the world in a more interactive, hybrid, and collaborative place, like Dan just showed us, right? Uh, so from the perspective of uh, some applied linguists, uh, the bro broader view of uh, literacy studies tends, uh, tends to transgress the established power relations uh, to transit more between borderlines uh, and also to be hybrid, you know, to mix languages, modes, mix different media, and also, of course, cultures. Well, uh, but it's not all that easy, right? Uh, here in our university and also when I talk to some teachers from uh, public schools here, uh, we uh, have been facing some demands. So for example, uh, teachers still want to control attendance and synchronous activities, for example. They want to know how they could coordinate exams, how they could apply exams so students won't cheat, you know, because um, want to cheat or plagiarize. Uh, also, how to punish students that don't attend live lessons and also, of course, how to encourage participation and discussion. 
So as we can see, however, even though we've been talking, <coughs> sorry, even though we've been talking about digital perspectives of education for so long, we still are stuck in these kind of discussions, right? That remain in the traditional way of seeing the teaching and the learning process. Uh, so <laughs> we've been facing lots of challenges and these are just some that came to my mind uh, first when I was preparing this talk. Um, the challenge can be both technical and theoretical or methodological, right? So we have, uh, we can't all keep our cameras on because our online, connect, our, our internet connection can't, uh, uh, can't sustain that, can't, can't keep our cameras on. Uh, it's really hard to make students to unmute their mic and speak up. And also we have all the challenges of time and space, just as Dan has just told us. Uh, and also we have some students' perceptions about everything that's been going on with them. They are overwhelmed by these excessive tasks to compensate the time we don't have online and live. Live, I mean, <laughs> mainly. They are willing to uh, create content with their own devices uh, they are willing to feel challenged uh, in a good way in the process of learning something new and they are willing to write and speak. Uh, they are willing to create something, to produce knowledge, right? Even though they are uh, in this situation that they don't go to school in person anymore. Um, so the question is, are we really interested in a transformation of spaces, uh, a transformation of practices, or we just want uh, this time of emergence to end as soon as possible so we can turn back to the traditional practices we have performed so well so far, right? Um, in this case, we have to uh, go back and and think about this question. And if the answer is yes, right? If the answer is we must take this time to reflect upon new practice, we must take the time of emergence to think what kind of education we want uh, when this pandemic is over, uh, then we must consider uh, to change not only the devices. It's not about the computer or the cell phone or the, the uh, the iPad or anything like that. Yeah, and also it's not about the, the tasks only or the lecture or the content I had to teach, right? It's about also to change the mindset, also to rethink the curriculum. And of course, uh, to, to reflect upon our attitudes. Uh, so this school community, uh, in my opinion, must turn the attention to uh, all the dynamicity of these subjectivities and meanings that have been constituting, uh, that have been in the world, that he, that have been making us what we are right now in this pandemic and all our efforts to keep teaching and learning during such difficult times. And also rethink about the languages, the cultures, and all the demands that both the children and the young people have uh, toward us, the university, the school, um, etc. So the innovation, innovative education is closely related to these uh, four or maybe more things that I, I put here. Decentralization of power, shared and collaborative authorship practice, Part participative intelligence and also hybrid cultural spaces and practices, okay? Um, so just to, to mention uh, a few um, practical examples, we don't need to change everything at the same time. I'm not trying to uh, get you all to learn everything again. Uh, studies have shown that uh, mixed practices are most likely to happen. So it's not going to be everything new at the same time. Okay. 
So we will have this uh, conversion of conventional literacies, conventional and traditional practices, and digital uh, literacies and digital attitudes towards uh, a more collabor collaborative work, okay? Uh, so I have here some examples of friends of mine that have been researching these for uh, some years. And of course, in, in my opinion, uh, these kind of mixed practices are also the way to improve our actions uh, in terms of in-service teachers' education and professional development. I believe that uh, we're not gonna, uh, we don't want to change everything at the same time. We still need to be confident enough to have our practice uh, in online spaces. And then um, with that, we could rethink and we could remodel uh, everything that uh, it's not working online anymore or with the the young and and the, the the young culture and the young demands from school and from learning right um, so here I have some examples that we can find in these studies and also uh, based on my own experience with students and also, I want to tell you that uh, it's really important to say that all of these attempts, all of these uh, challenges that we're facing, and uh, every time we, we try to make something work better, uh, are really important and is something that we should fight for. So. These are, of course, some unfinished reflections and things that we and my colleagues and my students, we want to build up together. I, I don't have, of course, all the answers. Uh, I have more questions than answers, actually. But that's fine because uh, the work should be in collaboration with others. If we go back some slides, you will see that it's part of this work to decentralize the power. Uh, so the more the better, the more talking, the better, the more finding things, figuring things out, the better. Uh, so together we can get creative, we can uh, go to our students and ask them for their demands, and we can solve the problems according to our situated practices. I think that's something really important because each one of us, we have uh, a different scenario to deal, right? So that's it. Thank you very much. Professor Chuck, your mic is muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, See, we could so hear you. <laughs> the challenge. Right? These are the problems. <laughs> um, um, technical problems. But uh, thank you again. Um, these questions of decentralizing um, uh, teaching have been uh, around for many years, and uh, over uh, some of them longer than I've been teaching, even more than 50 years. Um, and but we a lot of it's been talk or good intentions and uh and us falling back into the old old patterns um and being uh having a teacher in a in a room with the same yeah. people is one of the kind of just uh, structural um difficulties that are hard to overcome well the technology opens up all kinds of new opportunities um, and really to help us rethink in the ways that Dan was suggesting, but specifically about how do we get our put more of the engagement activity in our students, and how do we step back and we become more much more of a stage manager or or an organizer of the play and less um, 
the central character in the play. And uh, so I thank you, Anna Amelia. And now we're going to be uh, 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 Craig Kotit from UCSB is also going to be following up on this theme about the flipped university classroom. This was, again, the idea of flipping um, the classroom was an idea that came before uh, before the uh, new technologies were uh, used, but that was, again, an attempt to decenter uh, the classroom. Um, but it's not always easy. Uh, and uh, as Craig We'll say we tend to flip out is a an expression in, uh, we use in North America for going crazy. So we flip the classroom, we flip out. Um, so I stole your joke, uh, uh, Craig, but uh, uh, I welcome you uh, to do this now. So uh, if you put Craig on and take me away, um, we're ready to go. Craig? Yeah. Oh. Hi there. Thank you, everybody, for this opportunity to present. My name is Craig Cottage. I've been teaching writing classes at UCSB for 22 years now. And in that time, I never taught a class remotely. Uh, so it was a big shock when we had to move all of our classes online last March. For years, though, I had considered experimenting with flipping my classroom. Uh, I never did it just for lack of time. I never felt like I was prepared to do it. But when COVID-19 hit and we had just a few weeks to change everything up, I thought this is the spark that's going to make me try it. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today is what my experiences were, what my students' experiences were, and kind of what I learned through this process. So let me share my screen with you. Can you see that yet? There we go. Okay. So Salman Khan gave a TED talk in 2011 that I remember watching and I've watched it probably, I don't know, at least 10 times now, but he made this really compelling argument about the benefits of a flipped classroom. And essentially flipping the classroom means that students first get exposed to a subject outside of class. So whether they watch recorded lectures or even readings, they first get exposed to the subject outside of class. And then when they go to their classroom, the class time is spent assimilating the knowledge through problem solving, collaboration, projects, or other dynamic ways to learn. And I think part of what attracted me to this idea was that flipping the class means that students are doing lower levels of cognitive work at home, like comprehension and memorization. And then when they go in the class, they perform these higher levels of cognitive work, like analysis and synthesis and application and evaluation. And importantly, when students perform this higher level of work in class, they can get help from fellow students who might understand the content better and they can help each other. Students can teach each other. And also, of course, the instructor is there to help when, I, when, they're, when they're doing the, the analysis, when they're applying things live, the instructor is there to help them. And so again, COVID-19 provided the push that led me to make this transition to a flipped classroom. And so first, let me just share how I got started. So the first thing that I did was I bought a microphone and a webcam and I started recording my lectures. And 
this was a challenge for me because I had to learn a totally new software. I bought this software called Screencast-O-Matic that allows me to talk like I am right now and the students can just see me or I can just share my screen like a PowerPoint or I can share both at the same time. And I posted all of these video lectures to a shared box account so that they could watch it whenever they wanted to as often as they wanted to. Um, and I think importantly, as Dan was talking about, on their own schedule. And so after completing two quarters, I'm on my third quarter now, I've taught over eight classes. I did six classes this summer, plus I had, well, I had three in spring and now I've got another three in fall. So I guess I have to do my math better. Here are the benefits that the students cited for why they liked these recordings from home. So first off, students were happy that they could pause and rewind so that they could take more comprehensive notes. They mentioned that in the winter when I had many of these same students, they would often lose, uh, they wouldn't able, be able to get all of their notes down. You know, they'd be taking notes wildly, but they'd inevitably miss something. And so, they enjoyed the option to pause and to rewind. And students with short attention spans could watch the video lectures in much shorter bursts. And as Dan said, they could learn on their own schedule. And lastly, they enjoyed being able to go back to lectures to review for tests or for papers, but they enjoyed having it available at all times for them. Uh, I've also learned in the past quarter this fall, as students have gotten more fatigue from online learning, that students are sometimes less likely to take notes on recorded lectures. Students just this morning, I was asking them a series of questions this morning about your pros and cons of online learning. And they said, because they have 24 seven access to these videos, they might be watching it and thinking to themselves, I'm gonna come back to this later and I'm gonna take notes, but many of them never do. And so they said that the in-person lectures, because of their fleeting nature, it makes it imperative to take notes right away. And I think this gets to a point that I'm gonna reiterate in a second. And that is that the fixed state of online learning, meaning the fact that students are often in their bedrooms looking at the same four walls, and the same com computer screen day after day makes it easier to fall into some bad habits. And so I'd like to talk about Zoom, which is the primary software we use for the um, synchronous learning that happens at UCSB. And Zoom provided a lot more challenges to me, but here's what I learned. My biggest takeaway is that online learning exaggerates absolutely everything. Zoom makes apathetic students more apathetic. It makes distracted students more distracted. It makes engaged students more engaged. And much of the time, students don't share their webcam with us. So as a teacher, it's even harder to understand how they're doing and, and sometimes even what they're doing. Are you even here with me right now? So I asked my classes again this morning, these very questions about Zoom, and they repeated what others have said. They said things like, um, it's hard to stay focused on Zoom. I, I lose engagement. I can't stay seated watching a screen for this long. Many of them miss the vitality of the classroom. Some said even the act of walking to school, like walking into a classroom, opening a door, shutting it. It's almost like I'm entering learning right now. And when they exit, I'm, I'm, I'm exiting learning for a short time. They miss hearing the chatter of the classroom when they walk in. They miss talking with classmates, of course. They miss the study partners that they used to be able to get so easily in class. And one student said something really interesting today. She said, I miss something really small. I remember, you know, before March, if I miss something in a lecture, I could just turn to my classmate and say, wait, did you catch that, what she just said? And they'd be able to, to, to tell me what I missed. 
but we can't really do that very well on Zoom. Other students said that for many people, Zoom provokes anxiety. People experience a real resistance to participation and, and they fear that when they finally do speak, they're gonna talk at the same time as somebody else and then there's gonna be that awkward kind of wrangling over who gets to talk first. And this whole, all of these experiences on Zoom have led me to be even more aware of reaching out to disconnected students. And I need to remember that our class time on Zoom is my main way to reach out to them, whether that's through chat or a um, breakout room or an email after class if I've noticed that they're, I haven't seen them in a while or they haven't participated in a while. So at the same time, not all is bad about Zoom. And so I wanna offer a few silver linings about Zoom. I think Zoom offers students a great opportunity to learn valuable communication skills. I've done a lot of business consulting over the past 20 years, and I've sat in on many, many meetings, too many meetings. Um, but I talk to my classes about the, how the best meeting participants, they nod, they smile, they give positive body language and they contribute regularly, even when they're not the speaker. And so even though Zoom represents a more challenging environment for students, I think students can practice these skills that will serve them well in their careers. And if they can polish these skills on Zoom, they can translate those skills to an office environment or to another remote environment. And I, I sincerely believe that if they can engage and thrive in a remote environment, they're gonna do even better when we go back to in, an in-person environment. And again, this is not to discount the challenges of, of synchronous online experiences. Those challenges are very real, but if they can improve how they act, how they behave, how they engage online, I think they're gonna find it much easier when it does go back to in-person learning. The last two learnings that I have relate to what I can do as a teacher to improve the experience. The first one is that I, when I'm videotaping my lectures, I need to do the heavy lifting before I ever meet with students on Zoom, which means I rely on these video lectures to prepare students for what's to come. So in every lecture I record, I make sure to answer three questions. Number one, how are they gonna be applying this content? Every lesson that I'm teaching, how do they apply it? Two, how do the concepts that I'm talking about today relate to the concepts that I talked about in my last lecture or the, or the lecture before that? And three, this is a really practical one and I have to make myself do it, but I, I make sure to find places in the video where I ask students to press pause. And I wanna do that numerous times in each video so that they can apply the skills immediately. If I can get them to stop, open a Word document or some other document and start writing, I know that they're gonna be applying and learning more so that when they come to our live Zoom sessions, they're going to have qu questions about it. So some of these are about connecting content between lectures to make it easier for students to understand the subject. But some of these practices are to get them out of the habit of just watching. I think too often students are now sitting down and, and taking part in their classes and simply watching. They're not actively learning anymore. And so I try to incorporate exercises that demand that they do writing now to apply the lessons, and I ask them to turn those in for credit. Lastly, I realized that I need to change the way I was teaching online. My inclination is to look at the facial grid. So we don't have a facial grid right now, but usually when I'm teaching uh, live, I see a grid of all of my students' faces, and it's usually on the right-hand column of my computer. And my inclination is to look down at them because I want to see their faces as I'm talking. But when I do that, 
it doesn't look as though I'm looking at them. In order to connect to students and make it look like I'm truly looking at them, I need to look at this light that's on my camera in order to make it appear that I'm making eye contact with them. So that's taken some getting used to. Another thing that's taken some time to get used to, but that 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 is true of live classes as well, is that I think time stretches in really strange ways when we're online. For example, when I ask questions, it feels as though I'm waiting forever for students to answer. And again, this happens in a live class as well, but in a live class, I can see my students fidgeting. I can see them, you know, providing me body language to show me that they're thinking and that they might be about to answer. Just this morning, a student said that her Spanish teacher ends every single class session by saying questions, comments, concerns, and then waits just a split second and then ends the meeting. So she goes, questions, comments, concerns, end meeting. And the student says she often has questions, but she doesn't even have time to unmute before the meeting ends. So I remember thinking when I first started teaching, I need to give people at least 11 seconds to answer. And that makes me go one, 1,000, two, 2,000. Online, it's even more. And it will feel like a lot longer. One other thing is that screen sharing is a double-edged sword. When students ask for explanations, I love to open up a document and share it and, and type as I go and kind of explain things through my examples. But it makes it really hard to see incoming chats. Like right now, I see that there are chats going on, but I'm focused on my slide and my presentation. And so I know that if I tried to focus on the chat, I would completely lose focus. Students say the same thing, that sometimes they're trying to listen to a lecture, but there's this great dynamic chat going on among students, and they said it's distracting and, and disconcerting that they can't pay attention to both, even though they want to. So in a way, flipping the classroom has reversed things in other ways. In some ways, the very challenging job of lecturing in front of a class is easier when you can you can press record, stop, pause, you can do it over, you can take multiple takes to record, and you have your notes in front of you. But it's made it harder to conduct class discussions and create a dynamic class environment. There are ways, however, to improve class discussions, and I know Christine is gonna talk about that later, about how you can use breakout rooms to facilitate discussion and collaboration. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to any questions you have at the end of all of our sessions here. Great. Thank you, again, Craig, again. And yeah, it, this isn't easy. One of the questions, uh, we've been getting some great questions in here, and one of them, uh, and we'll get to them after, but one of them is saying, this has put a lot of responsibility on us and in a way it's a lot more work. It may be easier, but it's a lot, very time consuming, tremendous amount of planning, but which again creates difficulty for the sense of getting student engagement in it because we're working hard. I, one of my slogans about teaching is that in the typical classroom and when I started teaching, I was working really hard. And I was really proud of what I was doing. Yeah. But my students were just sitting back and and uh, watching television, in essence. And now they even watch television more. Um, but the whole idea is instead of getting one brain working hard, you want to get 30 brains working hard. Yeah, uh, that That's the trick. So we're going to be taking up these questions about how do you really make this collaboration work and how do you get peer engagement. There have been good, some good questions coming up on that. And uh, so we're going to hear now about, I think, about one solution that's going to be about this, which is about a project-based learning, project-based approach, challenges and possibilities in ELT remote education from um, Carla Regina uh, Morad at UFTM.
You're on. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. It's very nice to be with you today, tonight. Thank you for the invitation, Asir. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you guys. So um, the, the presentation, the, the theme of this presentation uh, moves with me a lot, moves me a lot because I have always, um, I've, I've been working with teaching. I've been an English teacher for such a long time and uh, experienced lots of approaches and techniques and methodologies. I've been an English teacher now uh, for 30 years now. And uh, uh, today I'm a professor of English, uh, e EFL at UFTM and working with professional development and training teachers, future teachers. So for me, it's, uh, it, it, it was, it's been a challenge to work with this methodology, but something that I, I believe we should face because of this changing times and changing scenarios, right? Uh, especially for us uh, who um, intend to work with national national standards, BNCC, Base Nacional Popular Comum, it's very important to get to know a little bit um, about it, right? So I'm going to share with you guys my presentation. I think I'm having some trouble with finding my presentation. Just a second. I can't find my presentation. <laughs> What can I do? Oh my gosh. E agora? O que, que eu faço? Eu já cliquei em share screen, mas não aparece minha apresentação. O que, que eu estou fazendo de errado? Ah, tá, agora sim. Agora, acho que eu saí um pouco da, fora do ar aqui, gente. Acho que foi problema de... I think I had a, a little internet problem, maybe. So, uh, the project-based approach, for me, was a challenge. And uh, this presentation, I would like to talk to you about it. So uh, I don't know if you know, but a project-based learning is based on the idea of experiential learning. Its main instructional focus is on the organization of the learning process on the basis of the pedagogical principle of active learning, learning by doing, teacher-student, student-teacher interaction, collaboration, Focus, focus on language use instead of language or instead of grammatical form, meaningful activities learning based on authentic real texts, production according to students' needs and interests. Although it's been gaining attention in Brazil as a preferable mode in recently approved national curricular standards for ELT since BNCC approval, right, in 2017 in Brazil, Results in PBL have been poorly publicized as a teacher training or development tool. So in this talk, I'll tackle two remote classes experiences 
with the application of project-based learning for EFL trainee teachers during an intensive remote classes period, which we called Período Suplementar Emergencial or Emergency Period here in, at UFTM. So I think the most common problem a person who is an EFL teacher, training teachers to be uh, uh, English language teachers in Brazil is what should Brazilian trainee teachers experience while they're learning how to teach a foreign language, language in Brazil, right? So this question now has changed to what should Brazilian trainee teachers experience while they are learning language and learning how to teach language remotely, right? The first challenge for me, and now I'm going to share some of my biggest problems with uh, this, the practice of this methodologies, methodology was how to align PBL to curriculum discipline, right? So uh, at Letras course, uh, where I, I teach, right, I teach English language three, which is a learning language discipline for, um, to prepare future teachers to deal with language but mainly there it's focused on language development and but the special focus is on reading and writing in english also i teach uh poppy in and in, in english three this poppy is a learning how to teach language discipline okay and it's focused on elt planning and material production so uh for this remote education period or for this emergency period at WFTM that we've been through for the last three months, uh, we were uh, provided with a Google Classroom Suite, uh, which is a, a package of uh, application. And uh, as a social, how can I say, device, uh, we, most of us, you, uh, most of the students decided to interact through WhatsApp, so through social, social media, right? And it was very good, very effective uh, for the, the, our purpose at the time. And uh, the three projects I, we decided together, but I proposed them and we adjusted according to their interests and needs were three. Two in the English language three uh, discipline and one in Poppy three discipline. Okay, uh, the objectives of the the two uh, projects that we developed in English three uh, was to write a digital genre in English. It was they decided that they were going to write a personal report of how they were dealing with reading and writing in English. Through, uh, during pandemics, and uh, another one was uh, that uh, they wanted to talk a little bit about how to plan activity, and this I I I, I uh, advise them to do because then they could link to this uh, exp personal experience of reading and writing during this this emergency period, and they had to devise or to to um, to make activities that would integrate in a reading and writing in English, okay? Uh, the first one was an individual text production, the, the digital genre writing, and uh, they had to share and comment each other's texts through Google Classroom. But um, the thing here, I'm going to... <laughs> to do a spoiler, a little spoiler, because I'm going to talk about the results afterwards. But the thing here that uh, I think it was especially um, problematic for me and for them after they saw, they realized, was that uh, we, they did everything that uh, we decided to do, but they couldn't uh, relate what they were doing, the commenting and suggestions, to their uh, actual read, uh, writing, okay, online. So they read, they read comments, they made suggestions to each other, but they couldn't 
um, assimilate or internalize or take into consideration and take the, all those suggestions and comments to their texts. It was really difficult for them to do that. It seemed that everything that they were doing, it was like they were doing in, a, in little boxes that they couldn't find links and connections between those boxes, okay? And uh, the, the, writing, the, the writing of the activity plan was a pair activity. Uh, they, uh, they usually, uh, they presented the, the activity for the whole group. And then we kind of uh, reflected and talked about making suggestions, basically, as a follow-up. And uh, for the next, uh, next move was they, they would uh, take into consideration that those uh, suggestions and those comments. And again, they couldn't find where or what to do it was very difficult for them to, to assimilate that and uh, put everything into practice in terms of uh, redoing and remaking and rewriting whatever they were trying to rewrite, okay? And uh, I think one of the most, the most successful uh, experience was in terms, because I'm going to show you the results in a moment, uh, was the teaching project based on PBL approach, where the students had the the students were practicing training to teach English, right? And then they had to uh, I asked them to write a project plan, the planning for a project or a simula simulation, and for that um, I I told them and we we discussed along all along the first classes. And we decided that uh, they were going to have a practical experience during the semester, that, the, that period, some, some, some weeks. And then they would, so they would have the experience, the practical experience with PBL. Um, we did a project together and then they would write a project uh, for future learners or, and then uh, they decided uh, if it was a primary, secondary education student. So they had the opportunity to, uh, to get in contact with the methodology in the first weeks and then for, for uh, intake to perform the project planning, right? So, um, the, this class was very dynamic. They were always in groups and they had to interview other students about specific questions made by them and produce a coverage report of remote learning from those collected data. They had to write in three languages, Portuguese, English and Spanish, because uh, we, I, we had a, an arrangement a new arrangement, and we uh, I shared the, the we shared classes. Me and another colleague, uh, professor of Spanish, at the same department. the The results uh, I I'm I'm going to try to to talk a little bit about the most important uh, categories for me uh, in terms of what I understand uh, about PBL. Okay. So active participation and group cohesiveness. Uh, from the 10 students enrolled in English 3, only one dropped the course. Nine of them produced everything that was planned and successfully finished the course. Although all those problems, they managed to, to, managed to finish the course. Half of the class dropped from POPI 3 classes, okay? We, uh, we, we started the, the term with 10 students. Uh, I started with 10 and finished with five, only five students. However, all of the remaining ones completed the tasks and successfully finished the course. In terms of cooperation and collaboration, the English three students were more introvert, didn't interact through messages, they only, if they did that, only if requested as part of the test, task. Uh, in terms of com comment and suggestion making, 
The group relied too much on the teacher. They improved the receiving and giving opinion collectively only at the end of the course. POP3 students reported no problems with assigning roles or responsibilities, coordinate or lead groups, suggesting, making, accepting, sharing thoughts, making use of WhatsApp group messaging a lot. They showed high collaboration and cooperation skills. In terms of the activities and the social skills that those activities involved, um, the English 3 class focused on use rather than form, and then that was accomplished as a principle for the, the project-based learning. Oral interaction, though, was not successful since the group didn't show interest in messaging through WhatsApp. In relation to the reading and writing activity plan, uh, two students wrote uh, more than I asked. <laughs> they wrote a reading project plan. And, uh, but at the same time, they, uh, they did this big picture. They avoided specifying the activity plan, uh, what kind of activity and how they would integrate reading with writing. Those, uh, those students were asked to rewrite their projects. Uh, in terms of activities and social skills for a POP3 class, POP class, as students at POP3 class had to interview students from other classes and then assign roles to group writing, reviewing and rewriting after correction, the communication was very intense. However, they didn't use the target language orally, maybe because of the focus of the, the activity was reading and writing, right? So for me, what have I learned? What I would like to share with you in terms of what I, my knowledge that I had uh, with this experience that could be a contribution to this panel. How can teachers support PBL remotely? First of all, I think that uh, I should, I must, or a teacher must seek engagement instead of control. For example, attendance and punctuality in meeting deadlines could be graded by the time spent on activities and count, can count as attendance, like asynchronic uh, activities. And uh, as the PBL um, principal is not having the teacher as the center or authority of the class, Students must take part and take responsibility in regulating the time they spend in each activity they do. It's not only we controlling them, they have to learn how to control themselves too for, uh, for uh, better accomplishment of the, the, the objectives of the, the, the discipline, right? Also, develop time management skills focused on collaboration, because uh, when we think of remote education, we think, oh, I have to teach my students how to time manage, how to manage their time. I have to give five minutes, 10 minutes, or a, a weekend, or a week to do this. But uh, I think that uh, PBL requires us to ask them to do this, to do time management, but focused on collaboration. For example, I noticed that students, as the, 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 the interaction was not synchronic, I noticed that most of them couldn't engage in collaboration because they, did, they weren't online when they had to, to, to decide things because PB, PBL, uh, PBL uh, presupposes that everybody works uh, dynamically, right? So they have to set a time to meet where we are going to meet, what, uh, what kind, how long we are going to take to do whatever we have to take. So this kind of adjustments, um, they didn't uh, know how to do very well. That's why I think that we should develop time skills, uh, time management skills, consciousness, but focused on collaboration skills. So they are not separate, they're together, right? Um, and also uh, the ability to solve problems. Students usually depend or rely too much on the teachers. For example, English 3 group, 
the, we had monitor, we had uh, teacher assistants at this period. Thank God <laughs> I, I had two teacher assistants that helped me a lot, one for each discipline. And one of and the, the, the assistants always uh, for English three group always uh, uh, having uh, got in con uh, was getting in contact with me and complaining how come students never asked anything never uh, they never never had any questions any doubts anything to ask her and. Uh, but they uh, keep contacting me, messaging or texting me directly, me, you, you know. So I think that uh, this student, student dependence because of the format that uh, we usually have in universities, like uh, lectures and this kind of thing, I think, I think maybe, I don't know, but maybe this kind of uh, project-based learning for uh, teacher training uh, was kind of challenging for them in this aspect. So I, I think one of the lessons I've learned was to teach the students the, to value more the classmates presence and uh, support. And uh, by doing that, I think we will be fighting this authoritative culture of those methods that uh, limit students to participation, to act, uh, active participation, right? And uh, the last thing that I've learned was to value creativity instead of value deadlines or time. Uh, oh, I have to, to do something. So oh, how long it, it will it take? No, I think that uh, uh, the creativity uh, was something that lacked a lot. We have, I had poor results uh, in those, uh, in Poppy 3 classes. I think it, it could be, it might have been a consequence of lack of time uh, to transfer the experience that they had in the first weeks with the actual project-based learning themselves because they were exposed to it as students. Uh, at the end, they had to transfer that as, uh, and uh, write their, their, uh, their planning, their project plan in the, in the position or as the author, as the teacher. And I think they didn't have the time, time enough to, to, to transfer, to transfer too many skills that they were having to deal with during this experience. That's it. I hope I have contributed a little bit with the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, again, it showed that there are difficult, uh, there are difficulties in, uh, in uh, this new environment, and some of the they reflect again some of the questions that have been coming up. But how do you get students to be more autonomous and act within um, this? And uh, 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 and one of the ways which we'll talk about, um, I'm just going to see the discussion. Um, we, for many years, for a number of years, we've been trying to work with peer reviews, and um, and that's been part of uh, your plan as well, your project base. How do you get students to work effectively in peer reviews? So that's going to be one of the questions we're going to be following up on, definitely. Um, okay, so now. We're going to hear uh, our final uh, talk from Christine, and he's going to be talking about uh, um, another kind of uh, way of getting uh, more student involvement with each other, and it's in the use of Zoom breakout rooms and how that can be used to increase collaborative learning. Um, so, uh, Chris, uh, uh, can we bring Chris up? Thank you, Chuck. I think okay. I'm I'm now live. Uh, so I want to thank you, Chuck, for bringing us along on this adventure from UCSB. I want to thank uh, the folks. I want to thank Asir for inviting us, and also our colleagues uh, from UFTM. Thank you um, for being along for this ride. 
And what I'm going to do is in a second, I'll start screen sharing, but I want to just sort of set up the sort of ride that I'm going to describe. What I'm going to talk about is nominally the idea of Zoom, which if you haven't used Zoom before is much like uh, parts of Google Classroom, it's video conferencing. And it's video conferencing with students and it's the idea of having real time synchronous sort of communication with your students. Now, I'm also going to touch on asynchronous because you can't do one really without the other. As I think a number of folks have pointed out, as uh, Craig pointed out, as Anna pointed out, we can't continue to do the things that we thought we could do simply because they exist. We don't want to, as Dan pointed out, have skiomorphs and we're just living in the past pedagogically. So, So my hope, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're seeing the title slide, Zoom Breakout Rooms and Collaborative Learning. If you're not, please let me know. All right. So um, I want to give you some context. The class I'm going to discuss where we did this work with Zoom and video conferencing is from the spring of 2020. I'm now teaching another section of it in the fall. It's a class uh, in the upper division. I work in a writing program at UCSB in multimedia writing. And we did, and I believe this came up actually in the questions uh, from Alessandra, uh, is we did a needs assessment for the entire university prior to going fully online in the spring. Fairly quick one, and I did one myself. So you need to understand that um, what um, what we found was that students had variable, enormously variable access to um, to technology. They had enormously variable uh, internet speech, which makes synchronous work difficult sometimes. But they wanted a real-time connection. So we are in this sort of interesting double bind. So Zoom was a way to foster real-time connection. But there's also the phenomena that we may all be experiencing now, which we call Zoom fatigue. It's the idea that you're in video conferencing for a very long amount of time and that there's a heavy cognitive load that's placed on it and you feel it physically. Now, what sort of helps is what I'm going to get into, which are breakout rooms, but it's also an older notion of collaborative learning. Breakout rooms are not decontextualized and unyoked from our pedagogical practices of the past. So many of us use collaborative learning. We may not have used Zoom, but the two go together quite nicely. So what I did, Breakout rooms, the way that they function ultimately is you're in Zoom, you're in a video conference, you can set up individual rooms in which you can put students into groups. I went with groups of three and five, asymmetrical groups as Burke calls them. So a little bit of background, many years ago, I was a secondary English teacher and I actually trained secondary English teachers as an English educator for a number of years. And I've also worked with grad students. So I went back suddenly to the late 80s, early 90s, and to theories of collaborative learning. Now, Zoom room, breakout rooms, worked around pre-established groups. So one of the questions that's come up in the chat is how do we get students to connect to each other? How do we create a place where they can interact independent, as Carla said, of sort of like this reliance on the teacher? And the Zoom breakout room is one of those places where that can happen. However, it has to be consciously constructed. Thus groups of three to five, and I'll get in to the theory now that's behind it. So. Going back uh, to Burke, and this is old research from uh, the 90s, that when you work and create groups, 
uh, teacher created groups tend to be higher functioning in the sense of remaining on task and completing uh, tasks. So rather than allowing students to choose groups, I actually assign them relatively randomly in groups of three to five. Now, when you do this, one of my favorite sort of theorists around collaborative learning in general is Ken Brophy, and he says, and I'm just going to read the first sentence, organizing collaborative learning effectively requires doing more than throwing students together and their peers with little or no guidance or preparation. And this, I think, is the key idea is you have to, as Craig pointed out, really prepare ahead of time when you're doing online instruction. If you don't, then you are going to have a series of problems. So what do you do? One is you pre I created specific guides for each moment of collaboration that we had in these breakout rooms. Typically, I would give students a role. So standard roles that are often used in English education and in composition education are um, sort of group leader, uh, the scribe, and then the reporter. Uh, I use the same groups over and over again. You can set up manually your groups so that people would, again, have a chance to work in concert with people over the fullness of a quarter. We're on a 10-week quarter system. Then I tried to use something, and this goes back, I think, to Dan's point uh, about we're in a different modality. So I had to make things multimodal, and I wanted to make them visual. This is what a direction sheet looks like. So as you can see here, these are actually, this is student work. And these are images that students created in this multimedia class using everything from Photoshop uh, to things that are freely available uh, like Pixlr. And what I asked students to do, and this actually was in preparation for peer review, which is also something that's come up and how do we structure that? This was in preparation for peer review. So I asked them to go in and talk about contrast, repetition, arrangement, and proximity. These are key terms uh, in graphic design. And I wanted to know why they liked the image in those terms. So they had to report back out. And they reported back out in two ways. There's a chat function embedded in Zoom and in most types of video conferencing software and they had to speak. So we're getting things in two modalities, but we're also getting back practice in peer review because this was intentional. The next thing they did later asynchronously was to do peer review, but they had to be taught explicitly what sort of peer review they were going to do. So one of the things that I think about, and I think we've all thought about, in this time of real serious uncertainty, pedagogically speaking, a pedagogical emergency, is our issues of equity and access. Zoom, as I said, requires reliable high-speed internet, uh, which is a huge equity issue. I know <laughs> throughout the world, access to high-speed internet is not universal. Access even sometimes to a computer is not. So there are real serious problems, and I'm going to get at how I address this, at least provisionally, and I can talk about it in a larger sense later. So what I did was we use Zoom, but we always had a forum, an asynchronous forum uh, via a CMS, a, a course management system, where students would be able to have a threaded discussion. So if they couldn't be in Zoom, they would be there. And we would be working on the same sort of ideas. It works, but it is less interactive and collaborative. And of course, that bothers me. So one of the things I've been thinking about is how do we build community asynchronously? So it starts at the very simplest levels. And there's research that backs up each of these sort of claims. One, send an email weekly at the beginning address the whole class, remind them that they're a whole class. You can use things like Flipgrid and uh, Dan described Loom to actually have interactive asynchronous media. And the other thing I would say is you have all been using collaborative learning in some way, shape or form, most likely. 
And if you have, it does transfer. Some of the lessons that you've learned over the course of a career, and we have people on this panel who've been teaching for a very long time, those things do not go away, even though you're working in a very different environment. So these are a series of questions, and I'll turn this over to Chuck because he's going to lead our discussion. But, you know, these are the questions that I had ranging from are you using Zoom or video conferencing down to the last one, which I'm keenly interested in, which is how do you create in an online space a sense of community and common purpose? And that's the question that I'm very attuned to in terms of this teaching, because that's something that I value and, and place a high value on, and I imagine uh, that we collectively do. So I'm going to stop sharing and step out and hopefully be back oh. here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, well, if we could bring all of the uh, five, all six of the presenters, including myself, onto the front of the screen now. So we'll all be available to talk. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and then we'll, uh, uh, we have had some very interesting questions. I'd like also to ha ask all the six, all six of us, we have, um, uh, we have uh, dual chats going on. Uh, the viewers only have a single chat, but we have dual. If, if all of us could go to the comments column so that we could have as much interaction with the audience and make sure that everything is shared across from there's been interesting discussions going on on both of those channels so uh, i'd like to kind of unite the discussions now um there have been um a lot of questions about uh and uh chris at some point we'll get back to your slide and uh, we'll have you share that again um all the questions in one way or another have been about uh increasing engagement of the students, increased autonomy. Um, there have been some that have been concretely about an old practice that we've been engaged in, but trying to bring it into the new space. So that's where I'd like to start um, with uh, how do we get peer review going? The question was initially was, does peer review even work? Um, but I'd like to switch that to how do you make it work? What have you found effective? And then what have you found effective within the new media to make the peer reviewing work? We've had a couple of thoughts on that, but I'd like to um, give uh, first the presenters a chance to uh, talk more about what they have found. And then I'm also going to throw it back to all the participants, uh, to all the viewers. I'll Just go ahead and jump in and... Uh and kick it off. Um, I think peer review can be very effective. It has to be directly modeled and talked about. A lot of students come into the, the uh, activity of peer review with, the, uh, with certain uh, assumptions that are not very effective. Uh, a lot of students, if, if they're not trained in peer review before you enter the, the exercise, they'll try to model what they think a teacher does in grading uh, a written assignment, like uh, correct, catching all the grammar errors, and that's it. Um, so I try to engage in a good session or two of discussion about what does it mean to engage with a, um, a fellow student's ideas in a productive conversational way. Um, what I end up doing is have them writing what I call like a peer review essay. Basically, I have them go through uh, a student's paper um, and take note of their reactions moment by moment. So, and they write paragraph one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way down. And then they write, how are they feeling in this moment? This, I call this movies of a reader's mind. And it mm -hmm. comes from um, uh, a good, a good, uh, Pedagogy of Peter like, Al Peter yes, Alba. Alba. Thank you. Um, expressivist uh, writing, movies of reader mind. Um, point by point responding first. Um, where are you at? How are you reacting in each moment? And then why? 
what is making you react this way? Are you believing it? Are you confused? Are you with it? Are you angry? And then write why. Then read it again and do another write-up as a whole. Um, I introduce a reading to my students. It's a really good one. It's called Responding, Really Responding to Other Students' Writing by Richard Straub, uh, Straub S-T-R-A-U-B. Richard S-T-R-A-U-B, a wonderful reading that uh, directly is written to the students to just say, here's, here's what you don't wanna do. You don't wanna try to be a teacher. Here's what you do wanna do. Yeah, um, and, and engage in the, in the communication about it. My basic rule of thumb is, is that the more they write, the more they're probably engaging with it. So I encourage a full page of just getting in there and writing your reactions and thoughts. So with that, I, I'm sure my, my colleagues have have more to add. Who's got other good techniques that they found useful? Uh, Chris? Uh, or Craig, you wanna go? Uh, sure, you, you go ahead, you go ahead. Okay. Um, back when unicorns roamed the earth and new wave music in the US was actually new wave music rather than retro music. Um, I actually did my dissertation on peer review and on computer mediated peer review. And the key thing I think is what Dan's saying, it has to be taught and it has to be intentional. And I, I, there's a sort of pattern. And then I'll mention one sort of out there interesting sort of little technology that you can use that I think really facilitates a different kind of peer review for our different time. But you have to do intentional work ahead of time, like Dan does. Like I said, that whole exercise that I showed you was to prep students for peer review and to model for them peer review on student work. So that means you have to have student samples to work with. And you have to convince them that they must not make comments about grammar and syntax. And the reason is because at peer review, we're in an early stage, a draft of something. It doesn't make sense. And as a matter of fact, research from the 80s and 90s shows that it locks it can actually lock writers up and then you have to get them when it's done to come up with a plan for how to implement the peer review and this can be as simple as a list of about five things that they're going to do before the next draft that they will turn in along with the work that they've done so and then finally what I do is the next time we come back into Zoom or if I'm making a video like Craig does, um, I actually highlight some of the what I think are better comments. Like, look at this. Look at this specific peer comment. I get students permission, but I'm only showing positive comments that show, I think the key point that Dan made is more is more in peer review. The more you write, the more you're going to do it. The one thing that I would say that I think is really interesting, and this goes back to another uh, technique of Peter Elbow. It's the idea of pointing. Peer review is often most effective when you point to something in particular in writing and say, I had this response here. It's what Dan was doing. But using video screencasting, I use screencast o matic like Craig, allows for students to do that, particularly with visual documents, in a way that they can't do as readily just with text. But anything, if you go through teaching it, asking them for a plan, reviewing the peer review, it tends to be really useful and it's actually affiliative work. And that's one of the things I discovered in my own research is some of the most important reason, just as with us, when we give our writing to somebody else, we're not gonna trust everyone, but we're gonna trust the people who've proven to us worthy of our trust. And so that, that's, that's all I got to say. Craig? Yeah, so um, I definitely don't have as much background on this as Chris, but uh, I wanted to touch on something that Dan mentioned that sometimes students are trying to kind of copy us as teachers. And I've actually found that maybe the majority of the time, if I don't give really good instructions and model how to do it, what I find is that a lot of students look at it as a social exercise. And it's a way of kind of bonding and becoming friends. And instead of thinking, I'm gonna build a better relationship with this person, if I give them really constructive, amazing feedback that helps them get a better grade, they think I'm gonna have a better long lasting 
relationship with this person if I tell them how great their paper is. So oftentimes the worst peer reviews are the ones that say, yes, great, love it, emoji happy face. And, and, you know, and then they get their paper back from me and there's all these you know, areas to improve upon and they feel let down by the person who was so not, you know, nice to them by writing all these great things. So I try to always frame the, the peer review as this is your opportunity to help each other get better. And not only will you help each other, but you're going to internalize the expectations for this paper by applying a rubric to other people. You're going to go back to your own paper and I think you're gonna have an easier time revising it because you've thought a lot about, you know, what are you trying to do in this paragraph? And what are you trying to do in this paragraph? And how did you build upon this piece of evidence and so on? So I think even though it's presumably about helping other people improve their writing, there is kind of a, a selfish practical benefit too that they internalize the demands of the essay and, and and if they're doing a peer review well, they they get better at their own writing. Um, Carlo or Anna, do you want have anything you want to add to this? Techniques that you're using, uh, like in the problem base. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to mention I study. Yeah. Now it's really quickly, Carla. Actually, uh, I just want to mention a study uh, of a friend of mine on collaborative writing. Uh, it's not exactly peer review, but it's really interesting to see how students work together on reviewing and building up on the same text. Uh, on my presentation, I, I I wrote the reference. It's Custodio 2013. It's a, a thesis, a master degree thesis on uh, teenagers. I think she worked with middle school and they uh, wrote um, short stories together. So she analyzes some of the process of reviewing and negotiating meanings and construct constructing the same uh, text together. So, uh, in, of course, it's in Portuguese, but it may be interested to some of our colleagues that are watching us. That's it. Great. And Carla, and then there's also uh, a comment uh, in the chat too that's relevant. But so, Carla. Yes, it's uh, before I talk about the technique uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, I'd like to to make an, a, po a point about how culture is not something that is vital or is decisive because you know we are Brazilians and you are Americans and we have the same kind of problems here and uh, so it's not something it's maybe it's not I think it's the human nature as Craig was was saying and I, I think I tend to agree with him that it's more uh, an intuitive thing that we do in terms of uh, social uh, proximity and social uh, seeking, you know, uh, uh, wishing to, to be accepted, etc. And uh, as a technique, I'd like to share with you uh, one that I learned when I was a student at uh, Unicamp in my master's degree. Uh, I don't remember the name of the professor, but she's, a, she's Argentinian. She, um, she used to do the following. It's, it was very nice. She used to get all the students' papers and uh, texts and uh, rub out the names of the students. So uh, when we received the, the paper, we didn't have, we didn't know uh, the author, we didn't have the name of the student, we didn't know who was the author of that paper, of that text. So I think when we deal with this anonymous <laughs> uh, author, I think it would, uh, it, it works, it works well. 
Yeah, I think uh, it, there's very much a question of who the students are and what the situation and program is, uh, because I think, and we have to think, and uh, as Craig was saying, we have to do the heavy lifting beforehand. And uh, Chris uh, was saying, you know, we have to be intentional, um, which means looking at the situation um, uh, and what will work. So I have one group of students, and then there's a comment from Paula Carlino, which has another idea uh, about this, um, where, uh, oh, why don't we just go to Paula Carlino's before we get to my, um, so as a way to teach peer review, have you tried collective group review with the teacher speaking only after students give their comments? Again, that's a kind of intentional structuring so as to um, avoid the authoritative teacher uh, saying where the discussion should go. Um, maybe I'll just chime in because I would say, I, yeah, first, yeah, absolutely. Thumbs up. <laughs> Thumbs up for doing that. Secondly, uh, part of this gets at, I, I think, you know, one of the issues here, which sort of swirls around peer review, which is assessment itself and the authority of teachers. So um, one of the things that I do is I have a portfolio-based system and a lot of folks I work with across our writing program, across writing programs in general, and I'm sure this isn't news to anybody here, but a portfolio assessment where I even I, I don't say anything at the first draft. I don't actually give them feedback on the first draft. They give each other feedback. On the quote, final draft, which is the second draft, I give feedback. And then there is a submission draft, so in a portfolio. So the assessment lines up with the peer review practice. And I think it goes to Paula's excellent way of the collective peer review that I really value and ask students to share real time um, and even, you know, bring, as I said, their peer reviews into class as texts, their responses because looking at student responses rather than the teacher saying that this is what you should do, I think really gets at what we want from it. We want, and we also want to get, uh, there's one metaphor, I'll leave you with this, and then other people can say smart things because I'm, I'm rambling here, but um, there's a notion of teddy bears and sharks in peer review. Teddy bears are the people that Craig described. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's like I'm bathing in cotton candy. I'm like swimming in happiness, you know, except it's not that specific. And then there are sharks who start to say, this is terrible. This sucks. As a matter of fact, you suck. And neither position is useful. So you have to get them into that in-between position. You do it, I think, with student comments. I, I want to, so there's a, uh, a kind of tension, not a bad tension, but something that has to be balanced here. So there's, on one side, we're talking about modeling. And the other side, we're saying, hand it over to the students. And um, we have different techniques for knowing how, how much of what sort to do when. I'm this, an example of class I, I'm working with now, it's a very special kind of class because it's in a program the students already have a collaborative environment and they will think of themselves as writers and it's ungraded. Uh, so uh, we don't have to justify grades. They don't have to chase after grades. They're concerned with their development as writers. Very self-motivated group. Um, for this people from UCSB, these, these are in CCS, College Creative Studies students. Um, as they go through the term, they change, grow rapidly. So, but at first they do, I found that I didn't need to model. What I do is I have them submit their uh, papers, the first draft in the forum. And I read uh, before class, before the uh, class that's devoted to um, a peer review, a peer discussion. And I, I read them and the, the class, then their group reads their papers beforehand. I read them very quickly and I say, well, what's the general state of play? And say, oh, so these are issues you might discuss in your group. And early in the term, it was things like coherence or have you talked both about your experiences and your the readings or sort of kind of um, structural issues or even um, help each other on the pros. 
because they don't have grammatical problems, but you know, they want to get elegant prose, right? So it could be like that. But then as the term goes on, they're getting pretty good at it. And they're also giving each other spontaneously. So I calibrate it. And so um, today's, I said, for today, I said, uh, well, they've all been, um, gee, you've all had very, uh, they were reporting on interviews and you're reporting on authors who take different stances to this question. I don't have anything specific for you to um, uh to uh, evaluate each other on or to review on, but there are these questions that arise. And maybe if we think together, you think in your groups about how these questions play out, that might give you another level of depth to your revision, right? So it's calibrate, it's both modeling, but it's, it's giving them open space. And I don't even go visit their breakout rooms. I just sit in the main room. If anybody wants to drop back in to talk to me, they can. Um, so uh so uh what, what am i saying I, i'm just trying to raise this issue of um how much modeling how much freedom how much reliance on their autonomy right and how much teacher intervention at what point how lightly or heavily right um so i so let me push give that back to you so how, how do you all, all think about balancing that that, that's a good question. And I think um, what I try to do before the peer review is more a modeling of the expectations, the, the elements of the rubric that they're going to be applying so that we're all on the same page with what the essay demands, right? Even though students are writing on different subjects, overall, they're writing to the same prompt and with the same requirements. And so I try to use a, a student model and, and go through paragraph by paragraph, looking at these questions that I'm asking them to respond to. At the same time, I, I think that Dan's point about how do you feel is so important because people don't really know how to talk about writing. And, and it, I mean, there are plenty of people at the university who are grading papers that don't have a big vocabulary to talk about writing. And so I think taking it down to the level of how do you feel is a great question because so often we'll read an academic sentence that we shake our heads and go, oh my God, that is awful. We know that we feel bad and we don't wanna read another 10 or 12 or 20 or 100 of those, but we don't exactly know how to fix it. Right. If you're a student, you don't know like, oh, you know, the problem is that you don't have a clear character here and there's no precise verb. You're you've got 20 prepositional phrases that are muddled and the arrangement of your sentence makes no sense. But the simple question of how do you feel gets them to do the work of revising it so that the reader feels better about it, because really that is how most of us are responding to writing is. Do I want to read more or do I want to read less? Anybody else want to chime in on this? Okay, well, this raises, I'm not giving you 11 seconds. Sorry, Craig. Uh, but this raises the question uh, underlying about where does student autonomy come from? Is it something that's already within the students, something that we can inspire, something that we structurally get the, um, uh, uh, we set the conditions, or, or is it something that's characterological? Um, so what is the student autonomy thing, which we all want? And how do we, which then gets a, can we foster it? How do we foster it? I can go really fast. I think, I think they have to, that we have to create a forum where they feel they have the ability to do it. And we as teachers need to respect our students. We have to show them the respect that we want to get as teachers. And I think that gets, that gets to this point of, um, do they believe that they'll be heard? 
do they believe that they'll be respected? And if they, if both of those things are true, I think they're much more likely to take risks, to talk, to express their opinions. But if it's not true, if they don't see anybody else in the class getting that treatment, they're not going to talk, and they're they're not going to gain autonomy because they don't think it's available in your class. Yeah, I would add on to that. I always uh, encourage my students to um, use their hobbies and their their research interests and and a game or anything that they're interested in and approach classroom concepts through uh, the application and the study of whatever they want. And I tell all my students, my assignments are invitations, not um, direct directions. Uh, and, and the key to that, to bounce off what's been said, celebrating their work models. Uh, to After every assignment to say, here's five really cool approaches that, that five of you guys uh, created. Uh, let's take a look at that and, 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 and remark on the amazing choices that were made here. Uh, and, and each one would be about a different, interesting way to apply the class concepts to their uh, hobbies and interests and passions. Okay, I'm good counting to 11. I didn't get that reference at first. Now I get it. Very good point, Chuck. Yeah, but you're not going to embarrass me by not somebody not spontaneously coming up with something. Uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to say something, but I'd really love to hear from Carla or Anna and sort of uh, how you view, how do you foster autonomy? Um, because I'm not going to say anything uh, brighter than what they're going to say. Okay, I'll go. Um, there, there, about autonomy and also about another question in relation to collaboration, uh, how to construct collaboration between students. Uh, in my experience, the, the construction of autonomy and of a quality collaboration lies in making room for topics that call attention of students and propositions of activities that can really mean something and also why not sometimes be fun for them. Um, well, we can call that uh, something like communities of practice or some people call it affinity spaces, some, some researchers. Um, and these spaces can make students feel comfortable and willing to express themselves, of course, it's not always possible to have 100% of autonomy and collaboration, but we can try something. <laughs> For example, last, last term, I put together some activities related to Instagram stories. So I teach English as a foreign language to uh, freshmen and they had to learn how to express themselves and talk about daily activities, uh, simple actions, um that they would perform in a routine in a, a normal or usual routine uh and then uh it was really interesting because during the preposition of the activity uh, that i told them what i want from them they started um to give some creative ideas like using instagram filters stickers uh written texts like uh, subtitles, um, GIFs, etc. And they and they had they were free to talk about things that were interesting to them. So some of them talk about food and recipes, other ones talked about plants and pets and makeup and video games and going to church. So it was really uh, many different topics. Uh, and this was one of the uh, best activities during the term. All of them, when they were giving feedback to me by the end of the, the course, they mentioned this activity because they felt so motivated about expressing themselves in something that they were familiar with, like the Instagram stories. And they 
and they also could uh, record and re-record themselves because I was not there live with them. They had to record and then send it to me. Mm -hmm. And another example, really quickly, I was talking to a colleague this afternoon. She, te she teaches Portuguese to teenagers. And she was telling me how the, she managed to make her 13-year-old students to engage in lessons about politics. So she set a scenario and she invited everybody to analyze political candidates' material, like video projects and propositions, etc. And after that, they had to create their own campaign as if they were running for office. Mm. And we are now experience um, elections here in Brazil, right, for mayors. And, and so they were so involved with that because they want to, to create uh, creative solutions for complex city problems. So uh, I believe that we only get autonomy and collaboration if we uh, find something that really uh, goes to their realities, that really calls their attention. And even so, we always have one or two that don't care, but we are teachers, we know how that, how, how, how is that organization of some students that simply don't care, but the other ones make the effort worth, right? Yes, so everybody has, we hope everybody has at least one place in their life where they feel autonomous and they're motivated. And it is part of our test to find out where they live, right? Where they're really alive and bring that life and mobilize that life in the classroom. Asir is reminding us that uh, our time is up. Uh, so uh, Anna Amelia has, has had that, the last word, which was a very good one. Uh, so uh, thank you all. Thank you all for uh, participating and thank you all for uh, the wonderful chats.